the, uh, with regard to economic liberalization and uh, democracy, there's a kind of conventional view. Uh, it was given an official form about a year ago by the uh, National Security Advisor, Anthony Lake, uh, when he announced what's called the Clinton Doctrine. Uh, the Clinton Doctrine states that we are now going from containment to enlargement uh, during the Cold War era. We contained the threat to market democracies, uh, but now we will uh, proceed to expand their reach. That's the prospects for liberalization of democracy, very bright for both of them. Uh, that uh, was, of course, greeted with considerable awe and acclaim. It's standard, it's unchallenged, here at least, uh, so, so much so that it would be superfluous to waste much time with quotations. In my view, it's false in every respect. Uh, I think in the real world, democracy and markets are under quite sustained attack, uh, including the industrial democracies, with the most powerful of them, in fact, leading the attack. Uh, as for changes in world order, uh, of, uh, there are some, I don't think, of the ones that Lake is talking about, and some of them are quite important. Uh, but much more important than the, than the changes, in my opinion, are the continuities, which are pretty dramatic, and I think they go back for uh, centuries in any respect. Uh, and I think they're not only more striking, but also worth a lot more attention, because they carry lessons with them. The continuities arise from institutions, the institutional structures are quite stable, uh, and therefore the tendencies are likely to persist. So I think we should not ignore them. Well, I want to look at a few of these questions. I'll focus a bit on, mainly on South Asia, but I think it's the same everywhere we look. Uh, there is a view of uh, world order which is quite contrary to the one that Anthony Lake described, that this great future for democracy and uh, uh, liberalization. Actually, it was put rather nicely by, uh, of all people, Winston Churchill uh, at the end of the Second World War uh, when he described, I think, the way the world works with admirable precision. Uh, he was describing the world that was then being planned, or, or at least that he hoped was being planned. Actually, it was being planned a little bit differently than he expected. Uh, but he was hoping to be a partner in the planning, not recognizing uh, where England stood with relation to power at that time. Uh, he said that the government of the world must be entrusted to the satisfied nations. If the world government were in the hands of hungry nations, there would always be danger. But none of us have any reason to seek for anything more. The peace will be kept by those, by people who live in their own way and are not ambitious, our power placed us above the rest. We are like rich men dwelling at peace within their habitations, and therefore we have a right to rule. That's the way the world ought to be and will be, he said. Uh, and that's reasonably accurate, except for his misconception of Britain's role. Uh, Southeast, <coughs> Southeast Asia was uh, much on Winston Churchill's mind at the time. Uh, he was, of course, desperately seeking then to hang on to the empire, including the crown jewel. Uh, he recognized, of course, that this would be a lot harder than it was uh, the last time he had to face this problem during the First World War when uh, Churchill was colonial secretary and uh, secretary of state in the War Department. And then, too, there was a problem about how to hang on to the empire. Britain had been seriously weakened by the First World War. Uh, uh, but it was still in a, and it recognized that it would have to go through early stages of what's now called decolonization. Uh, and that meant both a diplomatic and a military aspect. The diplomatic aspect was outlined during the war by Lord Curzon and the Parliamentary Commission. Uh, they recognized that England was no longer in a position to control the colony, to really rule the colonies directly as in the past. Uh, it would therefore have to set up what they called local facades uh, that would technically govern decolonization, but that uh, Britain would continue to rule behind uh, what they called constitutional fictions of various sort. Uh, still, the local facades would do the direct management and would give an appearance of independence, which they hoped would facilitate British rule. Of course, there had to be a mailed fist in the background, 
and that was discussed too. And again, Britain was no longer in a position to rule the whole colonial world by direct military occupation. It was just a week after the First World War. But new technology was coming along, which they hoped would help, primarily air power. Uh, this was the time when air power was just coming into you know, operation, and it was recognized right off that that would be a way to control civilian populations. Actually, it was pioneered by Woodrow Wilson uh, in his uh, uh, invasion of Haiti. Uh, where the Marines, for the first time, I think, ever carried out coordinated uh, uh, military actions against civilian populations using air power, and the Brit British got the idea. They decided that air power should be used to uh, control the populations and maintained that view. Uh, about 10 years later, in the early 30s, during the disarmament, there were a couple of disarmament conferences, uh, England fought very hard to prevent uh, restrictions against the use of aircraft against civilians. Uh, the reason was explained by another British statement, statesman, Lloyd George, uh, after Britain, when he was congratulating Britain on its success in blocking any such conditions, uh, he put it pretty pithily. He said, we have to reserve the right to bomb niggers. Uh, niggers is the word for everyone outside of you know, the white uh, rich people. Uh, and <clears throat> in internal documents. So we have to reserve the right to bomb niggers, and therefore it was necessary to make sure that uh, there be no constraints against the use of aircraft against civilians. Uh, Churchill had his own ideas about this. They actually came up uh, when he was uh, Secretary of State in the War Office around, uh, around 1920. Uh, Britain was having problems holding the empire, uh, and the uh, Royal Air Force in Cairo uh, sent a request to the government uh, uh, for authorization, as they put it, to use a poison gas uh, against recalcitrant Arabs as experiment. Uh, the recalcitrant Arabs in that case were uh, mostly Kurds and Afghans. Uh, the India office was a bit uneasy about it. They were having a hard enough time controlling the population anyway, and they thought that poison gas would, even if it was used somewhere else, would arouse all sorts of opposition. Remember, of course, that this is after the First World War. Poison gas was considered you know, the ultimate atrocity. Uh, Churchill, however, was quite outraged by what he called the squeamishness of those who are unwilling to use poison gas against uncivilized tribesmen. Uh, and he, he urged that it be done. It would create a lively terror, he said, and would uh, uh, permit the control of uh, the niggers. Well, those are themes that are also persistent. They run right up to the present day and there are good reasons for them, and we can expect them to continue. Uh, <clears throat> in the mid-1940s, uh, the situation was a bit different. Holding on to the empire was going to be much harder uh, because the United States, first of all, Britain didn't have the power, and also the United States really wasn't interested. It wanted, uh, which was, the U.S. was then running the world, and it wanted what's called a liberal international economy, meaning one that it could run, since it had just overwhelming uh, power, and those who know that they are overwhelmingly powerful, generally tend to be in favor of a certain kind of liberalization, figuring that they can win in the competition, a certain kind. I'll come back to that. Uh, Churchill was hoping for an American partnership in running the world, uh, but Washington had a rather different view, which was expressed a bit later by Dean Acheson in private discussion. Uh, he said that uh, during the Kennedy administration, he said, Britain uh, is our lieutenant. And then he added, the fashionable word is partner. Uh, they're supposed to hear the fashionable word, but we understand the real word. And if, given the power relations, of course, that's what happened. Well, going back to Churchill's uh, maxim about how the world should be run, uh, it's necessary to add two important qualifications to it. Uh, one is his statement about the rich men lacking ambition is completely false. The rich men are very far from lacking ambition. Uh, there are always new ways to uh, enrich oneself and to uh, dominate and crush others. And in fact, the economic system requires uh, that they be pursued or else the laggards drop out of the game. Uh, the second footnote is that it's necessary to dispel the fantasy that nations are actors in the international arena. Uh, so it's not a matter of the satisfied nations running the world because nations aren't actors at all. Uh, the, this is just the standard doctrinal camouflage uh, for the fact that within the rich nations, as within the hungry ones, uh, 
uh, there are enormous differences of uh, wealth and privilege and power, and they translate into uh, control over the uh, over state power. Well, when we peel away the remaining veils of delusion from Churchill's prescriptions, we do get the principles of word, world order when he wrote, and centuries earlier and today, uh, the rich men of the rich societies must rule the world, competing among themselves for a greater share of the spoils, uh, and uh, mercilessly suppressing those who get in their way. And they are to be assisted by the rich men of the hungry nations, uh, and uh, others are supposed to serve or suffer. Uh, actually, these are truisms. Uh, they were truisms, for example, to uh, Adam Smith uh, over two centuries ago, the much misrepresented hero of contemporary triumphalism. Uh, he pointed out that the rich men will, of course, follow what he called the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, uh, all for ourselves and nothing for anyone else. And furthermore, he added, they will naturally mobilize state power uh, to gain their ends. Uh, in his day, the, uh, it was the merchants and manufacturers of England that he was, who were what he called the principal architects of policy, state policy, and they designed that policy to ensure that their interests were, in his words, most peculiarly attended to, uh, however grievous the impact on others. The others included the people of England, he didn't really have the statistics to prove it, but he guessed and was probably right that the policies that were enriching the merchants and manufacturers were harming the people of England, but that's irrelevant because nations aren't actors. Uh, uh, but of course, the main victims, he pointed out, were the colonies, and he wrote quite bitterly about what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans, uh, referring particularly to India, of course, uh, which was already being devastated by British savagery in his day, as he was well aware and uh, as he condemned quite graphically. Well, today, the principles of architects of policy aren't the mer merchants and manufacturers of England. They are uh, huge corporate and financial institutions, uh, increasingly transnational in scale. Uh, and they and their ideologues preach a version of economic liberalism, but actually it's a double-edged version. It's uh, markets for the poor, but state intervention uh, and the powerful welfare states to protect the rich from, market, uh, from any market discipline. Uh, actually, that is another theme of world order that goes back to the 18th century, essentially without change. Uh, it'd be very hard to find anyone, except way out on the margins, maybe somebody like Richard Cobden, uh, who was literally in favor of free markets. Uh, almost everyone is in favor of a particular version of free markets for the poor, because then they can be more effectively robbed and controlled, but certainly not for us. We want state power, just as in the, to protect us from market discipline exactly as in the days of Adam Smith. Uh, actually, we've just seen a comical example of that in the last couple of days. The, uh, uh, the last election, uh, the big victor is supposed to be Newt Gingrich, the country's leading conservative and the greatest proponent of getting government off our backs and downsizing government and so on and so forth. Uh, when the New York Times uh, did a front page story a couple of months ago on uh, this rising tide of conservatism throughout the country, they quite reasonably picked his district, C Cobb County, Georgia, under the headline, uh, Conservatism Flowering in the Malls. This is a very wealthy suburb of Atlanta, very carefully insula insulated from any urban infection, uh, where people pursue what the Times called their entrepreneurial enthusiasms and their love for the free market and so on. Uh, there's a small footnote to that one, too. Uh, Cobb County gets more federal subsidies than any county in the country, uh, with two interesting exceptions, namely the two that are right in the state system itself. So they don't get as much as Alexandria, Virginia, you know, like where the Pentagon is and so on. Uh, and not quite as much as, uh, uh, as the uh, Florida home of the Kennedy Space, Space Center. That was another scam uh, developed by Kennedy to try to rip off the public and make them support folks like us around here uh, through the medium of fooling them into thinking it was important to see some clown walk on the moon for a while. Uh, so if you, t if you move out of the state sector completely, 
uh, then Cobb County actually gets more federal subsidies than any part of the country. Well, that's the kind of conservatism that Newt Gingrich is actually advocating, and it's, it's kind of intriguing that uh, while he, he was smashing the Democrats uh, with this talk about conservatism, none of them brought this up. You know, there was no one in the press or in, his, in the Democratic opposition or whatever who said, wait a minute, you're the leading advocate of the welfare state in the country, which is true. And the reason they didn't is because they don't want to expose this little fact, since they agree with it themselves. There's a common class interest that undercuts trivialities like political differences, uh, and you don't want to expose that. <laughs> the class interest is that the state is a welfare state for the rich, and it better be one, and more and more of one. Uh, and the rich are not going to subject themselves to market discipline. That's for poor people. For poor mothers, yeah, market discipline, but not for rich executives, please. They want protection of the kind that Newt Gingrich gets. Actually, if you look at his uh, famous contract with America, uh, I don't know how many of you have actually bothered looking at that. Everybody talks about it, but no one looks at it. It's kind of intriguing, actually. Uh, if you look at it closely, you can uh, sort of get an idea why a local cartoonist, Wasserman, uh, asked whether it was a contract with America or a contract on America. <laughs> uh, he, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it calls for very clearly, rather explicitly, I must say, you know, it doesn't hide a lot, it calls for uh, extending this double-edged uh, free market, namely state protection and subsidy uh, for the rich and market discipline for the poor. poor. So it calls for cuts in social spending and cuts in health payments for the poor and the elderly, denying aid to children of mothers on welfare, cutting welfare programs for the poor. Meanwhile, it quite explicitly calls for increasing welfare to the rich and in the classic fashion, one by regressive fiscal measures and the other by outright subsidy. The regressive fiscal measures, which are supposed to conceal the fact that these are welfare payments, are things like tax exemptions for gifts and estates, uh, not, uh, any kind of tax exemption is the equivalent of a subsidy. You know, if you don't pay $100 and shift the taf tax burden, that's the same as if the government gave you $100. It's just, uh, it's supposed to, you're supposed not to see it this way. Uh, so an increase in the uh, capital gains cuts and so on, whole range of uh, uh, straight welfare to the, to the rich. Uh, and the subsidies are subsidies for business, for uh, investment, for, uh, uh, more favorable rules for depreciation, and most important, what they call strengthening our national defense so that we can better maintain our credibility in the world. So for example, if anyone gets any funny ideas like, say, priests and nuns in Latin America about helping poor people, we'll have enough credibility to smash them up quite properly. Uh, the concept of national defense is a sick joke which anyone outside of a really totalitarian culture would just laugh at. Uh, the United States obviously faces no threats and you can make a strong argument that it hasn't faced any threats since the War of 1812, but certainly faces none now. Uh, it already spends more on what's called defense uh, than the rest of the world combined. Uh, it's by far the world's biggest arms seller which incidentally contributes to instability, not to security, and is understood to do that. Uh, just today, uh, there were new announcements from the administration that they're going to consider effects on the domestic economy in authorizing arms sales. What they call it is uh, they're going to consider the effects on job, job growth, but you have to bear in mind that jobs is an Orwellism. The word jobs is what you say when you mean the unpronounceable word profits. Profits is a dirty word. You're not allowed to say that. So therefore, you call for jobs, meaning profits, even if you're sending jobs somewhere else. Uh, so they're going to consider jobs in the newspeak sense uh, when they uh, uh, authorize arms sales, which are already going through the roof, uh, particularly to the Middle East, where they started shooting up uh, immediately after George Bush called on all countries of the world to stop sending arms to the Middle East, all but one. Uh, but so while national defense may be a joke, uh, military expenditures are not, uh, apart from ensuring a certain form of stability in the interests of the world rulers, the Pentagon has to continue to provide lavishly for Newt Gingrich uh, and his rich constituents. Uh, 
and in fact for people like us at MIT too, although we're sort of small potatoes by comparison with the ones who really ride the gravy train, the new Kingriches. Uh, the, the contract is remarkably brazen about all of this. Uh, so the proposals for business incentives and capital gains cuts and other such welfare for the rich appears under the heading, the Job Creation and Wage Enhancement Act. Well, it actually does include a provision for measures to create jobs and raise worker wages. However, there's a word added. It says unfunded after that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter much because, it, as I say, in contemporary newspeak, uh, jobs is understood to mean profit. So yeah, this is a job enhancement plan in that sense. Uh, and it's a job creation proposal. And it'll continue to enhance wages downwards uh, as they've been uh, proceeding for some years, thanks to very explicit uh, uh, social policy. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> this Gingrich is not really breaking any new ground. Uh, this was a, position, a policy that was, I mean, it's always been there forever, but it reaches a peak now and then. Uh, in the Reagan years, uh, it did reach a peak. The Reaganites succeeded in combining uh, the most passionate free market rhetoric with the most extreme uh, growth of state power and state intervention in the economy and protectionism. And in fact, they were pretty perfectly well aware of it. I mean, the state uh, expenditures relative to GNP by 1983 were about, I think, a third higher than they'd been a decade earlier. Uh, the, uh, and they boasted to, to businessmen about what they were doing for them. So for example, James Baker, when he was Secretary of Treasury, uh, announced to a businessman's con convention with great pride that uh, the Reagan administration had introduced more import restrictions than any of its predecessors, which was true, but overly modest. Uh, in fact, it was more than all of its predecessors combined. They had doubled the percentage of imports subject to one or another form of restriction. Uh, the restrictions are often called voluntary. Uh, but when the biggest mafia on the block tells you voluntarily to do something, uh, you do it, you know. Uh, and voluntarily, they were, able, they were get, allowed to get voluntary export restrictions from nice forthcoming people like Japan uh, to allow the American steel industry and uh, automobile industry to reconstruct behind high protectionist walls as they developed in the first place. Uh, if market principles had been, had, survived, had been allowed to function, there wouldn't be any American steel industry, or uh, uh, there wouldn't have been in the first place, in fact. But there certainly wouldn't be any now, uh, or automobile industry, or computer chip industry, uh, or for that matter, probably computer industry altogether. One of the Reaganite plans was uh, uh, huge expenditures from DARPA, the Defense Research Agency, to create massively parallel computing and also to move it from laboratories into small into businesses so that was they didn't just you know pay guys around MIT to work the ideas out and then hand it over to private industry which is the usual technique uh, but rather uh, actually set up the small industries themselves and on an unprecedented scale uh, there were also huge uh, welfare payments by fiscal measures of the usual kind. That's one reason why inequality soared during the Reagan years, back to where it was in the 1930s. Uh, in England, they've done even better. It's back to where it was in Victorian times. Uh, there are, uh, and this, this shows. So for example, there are two areas of the world where hunger has actually increased in the 1980s. Uh, one is Sub-Saharan Africa, and the other is the United States. And that's pretty remarkable when you think that this is by far the richest and most privileged country in the world. Uh, uh, actually, England may have done even a little better. There was a study recently by a, an old uh, Victorian charity with all sorts of lords and ladies and the queen as the patron and that sort of thing, uh, which studied the uh, uh, nutritional level of British children on benefits, welfare, it's about a quarter of children and discovered that they, their nutritional levels were below those of the workhouses uh, in the Victorian period. Uh, so that's uh, uh, another aspect. They, they went even beyond the United States in uh, liberalization combined with protection. Uh, well, all of this is much more general. It's not just the United States. It's worldwide. Uh, the uh, UN Development uh, Program 
put out in its 1992 report uh, discussed extensively the growing protectionism of the rich countries in the past generation or so, uh, which they claim has been a major factor in doubling the gap between the poorest 20 percent and the richest 20 percent over this generation. Uh, they estimate that various protectionist and financial measures taken by the rich countries have deprived the South of a half a trillion dollars a year which is about 12 times total aid. Uh, most of the aid, incidentally, is export promotion under one or another guise. Uh, the distinguished Irish diplomat Erskine Childers, writing about this recently, uh, uh, he described that, that as virtually criminal, which is quite correct. Uh, we need only think of what the World Health Organization calls the silent genocide, uh, by which, under which 11 million children die every year because the rich countries simply deny them pennies of aid. They're too busy enriching people like Newt Gingrich. Uh, the United States happens to be the most miserly of all. It has the worst aid program there is in the developed world. And even that's a fraud because most of the aid, a large part of the aid, maybe over a third, goes to a rich country, uh, one of the richer countries in the world, namely uh, uh, the uh, Washington's Israeli client. Uh, if you eliminate that so-called aid, the aid budget virtually doesn't exist. It's kind of a major tribute to the U.S. propaganda system. I mean, in addition to the belief that anyone, I mean, the, the fact that they can convince people that uh, Newt Gingrich is in favor of small government is sort of pretty interesting in itself. But another tribute to the effectiveness of the propaganda system uh, and the kind of education that, you know, we give people so that they can then carry this on. Uh, is that uh, uh, there was a study recently done by the University of Massachusetts, a po polling study in which they asked people to estimate the biggest items on the federal budget. And most people think that the biggest item on the federal budget is, is foreign aid, uh, which you, know, is, you can't even find with a microscope. Uh, uh, they rank as second welfare, which also barely exists, incidentally, uh, much exaggerating the welfare that goes to, uh, you know, black mothers driving Cadillacs and that sort of thing. Uh, and those are the things you see in the headline. When they talk about welfare, they're not, of course, talking about the real kind, uh, the welfare for the rich, which vastly exceeds uh, the pennies that may dribble down to the poor. Uh, well, there are many aspects to this uh, huge ripoff. Uh, one of them is what's called biopiracy now in the third world. Uh, in India, for example, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a customs official stopped on the border, a couple of German scientists, I think they were German scientists, who were leaving the country with some odd stuff in their suitcases, namely 30,000 carefully arranged bugs. Uh, and when they looked into it, they found, yeah, there's potential. Most of the gene, genetic richness is in the South. So the idea is to go steal it and then patent it. Uh, and maybe slightly modify it. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, it's inaccessible to the people who, from whom you stole it. Uh, this reaches really exotic levels sometimes. It turned out recently that there's, a, uh, there's some super exploited Indians in Panama and Costa Rica who are used to do work so grotesque that nobody will do it, the Guaymi Indians. And they're supposed to have various immunities. Uh, and it turns out that the U.S. Commerce Department recently patented the gene lines of a Guaymi Indian woman. So the United States now owns her genes and has patented them. Uh, and if they find out anything useful from them, fine. But uh, you know, the people down there are never going to see it. Well, this is no small business. Uh, the, uh, just last month, the UN, uh, there was a UN development report uh, which estimated that Western corporations Robbing, are robbing developing countries and indigenous peoples of 5.4 billion a year. That's what they would be entitled to in royalty payments if the multinational food and drug companies paid for the plant varieties and the knowledge that they're stealing. Uh, third world species, they say, plant species, provide the pharmaceutical companies with about 30 billion a year and they also point out that that vastly outweighs the so-called piracy by third world countries, piracy in the sense that they don't observe the Western-imposed intellectual property rights. These are new inventions 
created by Western countries in the last couple of years. They never accepted them themselves while they were developing, uh, but they are designed to try to ensure that uh, the uh, technology of the future is monopolized by the rich, by the big corporations, uh, while uh, meanwhile you rob the poor. The idea is that the, you know, if uh, say people in some in Brazil or something or Liberia or wherever have for thousands of years been bleeding, bre breeding plants and discovering herbs and figuring out how things work and so on, that's not intellectual property because they don't have a piece of paper signed by a court that says, you know, you own it. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, a pharmaceutical company up here scours the area and steals them and maybe steals somebody's blood uh, and either makes a change in it or doesn't, that's property, and then nobody else is allowed to duplicate it. Uh, these property rights program, uh, uh, aspects of uh, the GATT agreement now, they're sort of you know, enshrined in GATT. Uh, not only are they highly protectionist, as large aspects of the so-called free trade agreements are, but they're even counter to economic efficiency and intended to be. Uh, so what they're trying to impose on the, uh, India is particularly upset about this, but they've already given in. You know, they've already liberalized the drug industry, which means give it away. Uh, what they were particularly upset about, while well, some people were at least fighting back, was uh, the change from process to product patents. That's a recent innovation in the West. Product patents means you, uh, you can't, if somebody makes a product, you can't figure out a smarter way to produce it. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and then produce it by your new method. If it's a process patent, you can do this. Uh, the point of this is to cut back technical innovation uh, and to ensure more wealth for the rich. This has nothing to do with markets or economic efficiency or anything else. Actually, these things were tried earlier in the century uh, with well-known results. France had product patents for a while, back about a century ago. And that's one reason why the French chemical industry collapsed and why Switzerland has a big chemical industry. They simply crossed the border uh, where you didn't have so many constraints against uh, innovation. But now it's worldwide, uh, and therefore the rich corporations can slow down using state power, can slow down innovation and development, and ensure uh, uh, control and domination. Uh, meanwhile, robbing the poor of billions and billions of dollars a year. Well, without proceeding, uh, the, unless you adopt the class analysis that uh, Adam Smith considered too obvious to comment on, uh, unless you accept that as a, pre uh, uh, as a pre it is a prerequisite, to, as he, of course, understood, as any sane person understands, uh, to any rational discussion of world order. And if we add Adam Smith's footnotes to Churchill's maxim, then the picture of world order becomes, uh, comes before us with considerable clarity. Well, the unwillingness to pay attention to these truisms uh, undermines a good deal of the uh, commentary about world affairs, uh, uh, including scholarship in this case. So take, say, South Asia. Uh, there is a one major schol recent scholarly study on U.S. relations with South Asia using new release documents and so on, Robert McMahon's Cold War on the Periphery. And uh, like a lot of scholarship, it gives a lot of interesting data in it, and then the conclusion. Conclusion is always predictable. There's a bottom line, no matter what the facts are. The conclusion is that U.S. policies were motivated by fear and psychosis, uh, not by an attempt, not, not by an interest in material gain like other powers. Uh, kind of word of advice, uh, if you want to be accepted within respectable society, that has to be the conclusion. Doesn't matter what facts you come up with. But the conclusion has to be that the United States is unlike everyone else in that it's not motivated by material gain, just strange fears and psychosis <laughs> and errors and so on and so forth. Well, what are the what are the fears of? Well, there's an answer to that. The fears, this is, you know, this is declassified documents, so it's up till about the mid-60s. The fears were of Russia and China. So then the next question, well, what was the threat of Russia and China? Like, did they think Russia and China are going to sweep over South Asia or something? No, nobody thought that. Uh, the fear was, as Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, put it, uh, with regard to Russia, the fear was that the third world, especially South Asia, was enormously impressed by Soviet industrial progress, uh, which offered a model that they might follow. Uh, with regard to China, uh, Eisenhower and later Kennedy, uh, were concerned that Chinese economic success 
might encourage others to pursue the same path. Now, there would be consequences to that. The consequences would be that the region would not fulfill what the State Department in uh, 1948, George Kennan State Policy Planning Board, uh, described as they would not fulfill its main function, as they put it, as a source of resources and uh, uh, raw materials, cheap labor, market opportunities, uh, investment opportunities, and so on, uh, on terms favorable to foreign investors. Uh, that wouldn't happen if, if people followed uh, what was called economic nationalism, you know, independent development on, let's say, the Chinese or the Russian or some other model. Models which, incidentally, the World Bank, as late as 1990, described as quite successful. Uh, they described both China and Russia as surprisingly successful examples of development uh, which they, they were able to carry them off because they weren't too big to get crushed. And in fact, if you look at the figures, if you compare, say, Russia with uh, countries at similar levels of development in 1915, say Brazil, uh, you can see exactly what they mean. But again, these are things we're not allowed to talk about. Uh, well, that's a fear. Now, now we're getting the source of the fear. The fear is that China and Russia might provide models uh, that would lead other countries to develop in ways which would undercut uh, their main function that they're supposed to fulfill uh, in service to the rich men of the rich countries. Uh, and those fears are quite realistic. They're not psychotic at all. Uh, notice that they are not fears of the nation. In that sense, McMahon is quite right. It's not that the nation had those fears. Rather, they're fears of the principal architects of policy in Adam Smith's terms. Uh, and it's perfectly true that the nation doesn't seek material gain, uh, but the nation also doesn't formulate and execute policies. Uh, the principal architects, on the other hand, plainly do seek material gain and power, and they want to make sure that their interests are most peculiarly attended to, uh, and that explains the policies quite directly, uh, but in terms that you're not allowed to use, because things that were transparent to Adam Smith are now considered politically incorrect. Uh, you're not supposed to talk about uh, this class distinction that determines how policy is formed. Uh, the planning record, in fact, is quite explicit about the vile maxim and how it has to be pursued. So take, say, Latin America, where the United States, of course, has been overwhelmingly dominant. Uh, in around 1945, when the U.S. was organizing the world, uh, the uh, South Asia didn't pay much attention to, I should say. That was peripheral. In that sense, uh, McMahon is quite correct. Uh, Latin America, on the other hand, was quite central. In fact, the U.S. had finally achieved its goal of kicking its main enemies, France and Britain, out of Latin America. Uh, there was nothing about Russians or Chinese or anything like that, and they were going to take it over. Uh, but there was a problem. The problem was indigenous. As the State Department put it, the countries of Latin America were uh, dominated by what they called the philosophy of the new nationalism. Uh, the philosophy of the new nationalism holds that the prime benefit, I'm quoting it, the prime beneficiaries of a country's resources should be the people of that country. Uh, and, it, and the new nationalism sought to achieve uh, independent development uh, that would benefit the whole population. Well, the U.S. position was that the new nationalism has to be destroyed in all its forms. That's what they said. And there was, in fact, a conference in Mexico in February 1945 where this came to a head. And, of course, the U.S. won given the power relations and there was no more new nationalism, uh, Latin America would be able to develop only in a manner complementary to the U.S. economy, not competitive with it, uh, and without any nonsense about the prime beneficiaries of a country's resources being the people of that country. There are to be foreign investors. Uh, they're the prime beneficiaries. And also no nonsense about equality. Uh, people look at Latin America today and are kind of surprised, like the World Bank has published analyses in which it points out that the level of inequality in Latin America is the highest in the world. And as even the World Bank concedes, equality, relative equality is a major factor in economic growth. And they point out correctly that that's one of the reasons why Latin America is a basket case. But it didn't get there just by laws of nature. Uh, there were a lot of reasons, but one of them was very conscious social policy, special kind of markets for the poor and state protection for the rich. Uh, if you look at the later record, the theme that runs through, repeated over and over, is that the greatest threat to U.S. interests is not in internal secret planning documents. This happens to be NSC reports at this point. Uh, the greatest threat is nationalistic regimes 
which are responsive to pressures from the masses of the population for improvement in low living standards and diversification of production, meaning for domestic needs instead of the prime beneficiaries abroad. Uh, in June 1945, so right when they were beginning to plan the post-war era, the, uh, there was a major study by the state and the war departments uh, in the United States. It used to be called the War Department, you know, pre-Orwell, pre now it's the Defense Department. Uh, the state and the war departments warned the major threat that they perceived in the world was what they called a rising tide all over the world wherein the common man aspires to higher, higher and wider horizons. And that has to be stemmed, they said, and here's where the Russians come in. Uh, they said, we don't, the Russians, there's, they said there is as yet no proof that the Russians are thinking of associating themselves with the aspirations of the common man. But it's possible, they said, that they may have flirted with the thought. Uh, and we therefore can take no chances. Uh, so we have to ring uh, Russia with bases and bar it uh, an outlet to its only warm water port and so on because, you know, you never know. They might flirt with the thought of associating themselves with the aspirations of the common man. Of course, in reality, there was very little danger of that, but, you know, they have their own illusions. Uh, and uh, they noticed that this looked kind of illogical. I mean, given that we own everything and run everything and are super powerful, uh, it's going to seem illogical to people that uh, we're surrounding Russia with bases and containing them. But they concluded that this was a logical illogicality. The reason it was a logical illogicality is that, by definition, our motives are pure and everyone else's motives are base. Uh, so therefore, the fact that we're carrying out what looks on the surface to be illogical is really logical. So it's a logical illogicality. Actually, that's how South Asia begins to get in the act. Uh, part of this logical illogicality was arming Pakistan not for any defensive purpose, but as a, but as a forward base uh, against the Soviet Union, quite clearly. And as McMahon correctly points out, that's what brought the Cold War to South Asia. Uh, and it also led to Indian-Pakistani conflicts, ultimately to the 1965 war, uh, where the whole U.S. policy collapsed, the war fought on both sides, mostly with U.S. weapons. Uh, McMahon concludes that this could have been a zone of peace, as Nehru had wanted, maybe, uh, but uh, had, not, had the U.S., he says, not brought the Cold War in by these errors and, uh, you know, illusions and uh, uh, psychosis about the Russians and uh, the Chinese, which were perfectly realistic once you decode them. Uh, but uh, 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 the, uh, uh, they, they were quite logical, and they follow from the Churchillian vision with Smith's footnotes. I should say that the major problem was always well understood, the problem of the rising aspirations of the common man and all these other funny ideas. Uh, there's an interesting discussion between, I, private discussion between Eisenhower and Dulles about this uh, around 1953 or so. Uh, Eisenhower's complaining that uh, uh, to his Secretary of State that the communists have an ability to organize to appeal to the masses of the population. And Dulles adds, yeah, that's uh, some capacity that we can't duplicate. And then he explains to Eisenhower the reason. He says, the communists appeal to the poor who are always trying to plunder the rich. You know, that's the really big problem of world history. Uh, and we find it somehow hard, or at least they hadn't yet figured out how to sell our line, which is the rich should plunder the poor. It's kind of like a PR problem. Uh, but they've now gotten a little better, so you finally do get Newt Gingrich, let's say, advocating that the rich plunder the poor, but with enough cooperation from the educated classes so that the transparent reality isn't seen. That's pretty much the lesson of the last election. Speaking of democracy, what this reflects is the growth of a really deep-seated totalitarian streak in U.S. culture. When you get away with things like that, that's something that a well-run totalitarian state could scarcely duplicate. Uh, well, uh, what is going on in, uh, I mean, India is actually not a bad example of this. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Russia was indeed committing all sorts of crimes. Uh, one of them was that it was offering some kind of a space for independent development. In addition, it wasn't, you know, lining up to the aspirations of the common man, but its very existence led to some space for independent development, and it sometimes, for opportunistic reasons, uh, would uh, 
you know, help, uh, help out, tar uh, help independent growth. India is a clear case. Uh, under the British, under British rule, India was a total disaster area. Uh, but uh, development did begin, at least in some areas, after the British left. Uh, not, however, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, there, uh, mostly British multinationals made huge profits in India by overpricing, counting on their monopoly of the market. Uh, with the help of the World Health Organization and UNICEF, uh, India began finally to escape from these controls, but it really wasn't until 1961 when the public sector drug production was established with Soviet technology. That led very quickly to radical reduction in drug prices. Uh, for some antibiotics, drugs fell as much as 70 percent, and the multinationals were in fact compelled to cut their prices just to uh, continue to remain in the market. So that's the kind of you know, malicious Soviet interference with market democracy uh, that we have to stop because it was allowing millions of people to survive disease and it was interfering with the holy market, which is of course even more ridiculous in the case of pharmaceuticals uh, than it is elsewhere for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, that was one of Russia's crimes, which indeed greatly infuriated the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations. Uh, fortunately, that's overcome with the Soviet Union gone and capitalism triumphant. The transnationals have now taken over again, most recently thanks to GATT. Uh, so India has abandoned its public pharmaceutical industry. It's liberalized, and we can look forward to a sharp increase in deaths, along with mounting profits for people uh, that matter. That's uh, market liberalization in the real world. Well, <clears throat> I don't know. If there was time, which there isn't, I would have liked to go through uh, some of the history of this. Actually, if you look back at the history in the 18th and 19th century, it is kind of remarkable. It's being relived almost exactly. I mean, maybe the, uh, you know, the, the way it's described is a little more literate sometimes. But apart from that, it's very similar. Uh, in brief, India was subjected to one after another economic experiment on the best economic principles, uh, beginning in Bengal and then the rest of India and so on. Every one of them, of the experiments, had the same outcome, and it was recognized. The outcome was it was a complete disaster for the population and very successful for the architects of the experiment. Actually, that's, uh, that's something that generalizes. The same is true in Latin America, in Brazil, in the Philippines, in Haiti. Everywhere you look, there's economic experiments carried out, in fact, for now, over two centuries, uh, by very well-meaning thinkers, you know, with the best ideas. And it, now it's the World Bank and so on, or let's say Jeffrey Sachs at Harvard or someone. Uh, and these experiments always have the same result. I mean, almost without exception, you know, I mean, I suppose you, you look, you can find some exception, but it's certainly overwhelmingly true that they are a complete disaster for the, for the experimental animals and a huge success for the guys who designed the experiment. Somehow we're not supposed to conclude anything from that. Uh, and again, if you're really well educated, you understand that nothing follows from that. Just, you know, the good benevolence gone awry and so on. I should say that it was never misunderstood. So, for example, the Permanent Settlement of 1793 carried, introduced a big economic experiment, and the, the British had an inquiry commission in 1832 that reviewed it. They said, the settlement fashioned with great care and deliberation has, to our painful knowledge, subjected almost the whole of the lower classes to most grievous oppression. Not unlike what's going on now. Uh, but they concluded, therefore, that it must be continued uh, because of the principles of political economy, the holy principles. Uh, actually, they also pointed out, or a little later, the commission, you know, uh, Governor General Lord Benting pointed out that it wasn't a total failure. He said that it was ruinous for the population, but it has this great advantage, at least, of having created a vast body of rich landed proprietors deeply interested in the continuation of British dominion and having complete command over the mass of the people uh, whose growing misery is therefore less of a problem than it might be. Uh, in fact, Bengal was what is now called an economic miracle. That's what it means. It means a total disaster for the population, but sometimes pretty decent macroeconomic statistics and a lot of profit for the rich and, of course, for foreign cor corporations. There's plenty of uh, uh, such economic miracles these days, and they mean about what they meant in the mid-19th century. Well, uh, that's, uh, uh, meanwhile, India was financing about 
two-fifths of Brit Britain's trade deficit. It was uh, providing markets for British manufacturers, uh, providing resources, including opium, for sale to China. Uh, it was providing troops for British conquests, uh, Egypt, Sudan, Burma, South Africa. Most of the costs were borne by India. Uh, it was, of course, also providing the troops for its own conquest. That's a standard part of imperialism. About 90 percent of the troops controlling the Indians were Indian sepoys. That's, again, classic. It was also providing indentured servants, essentially slaves, uh, throughout the colonial world. Uh, but the financial, uh, but the economic principles that Britain was imposing uh, were, at the same time, uh, destroying India, and quite knowledgeably. Uh, India and England were roughly at the same level of industrialization. Uh, in fact, India had some uh, comparative advantage in textiles around the early 18th century. Brit Britain imposed harsh tariffs, just as it did on Ireland to stop Irish woolens, and it succeeded in, in, in deindustrializing its colonies, in the case of Ireland even depopulating it as well as deindustrializing it in India deindustrializing it, and they knew exactly what they were doing. You look back at the liberal historians, they describe it. So Harold Wilson, who was one of the fr friend of James Mills, you know, leading liberal of the early 20th century, uh, as a free trader, which he was, he deplored the measures that Britain was undertaking to destroy Indian industry, but he concluded that they were necessary for the following reason. Uh, had they not been carried out, the mills of Paisley and Manchester would have been stopped in their outset and could scarcely again have been set in motion, even by the power of steam. They were created by the sacrifice of Indian manufacturers. And that's quite true. Uh, the same happened in Egypt at about the same time. The only reason it didn't happen here uh, is that the colonies were too powerful, in fact, super powerful uh, in the uh, uh, 18th century. The colonies here were so rich that life expectancy was higher than it was for the British upper classes until into the 20th century. And therefore, the United States was able to impose very high tariffs to, uh, uh, to, to ensure the, uh, that the main commodity, cotton, would be cheap by a slight market intervention, namely exterminating the native population and bringing in slaves. Uh, conquering the continent and in other ways developing by exactly the same method that everyone else has developed in history. Uh, the uh, Nehru, in his writing in an Indian prison, in, in a British prison uh, in 1945, was quite realistic when he said that the real and fundamental cause of the appalling poverty of the Indian people uh, is uh, these policies of Britain. There's very little doubt of that. Incidentally, it's that kind of uh, insight that made, or attitude that made Nehru so utterly despised by American leaders. It's kind of interesting to read the internal documents on this. Uh, the way they describe Nehru then is almost the same as the way they describe people like Aristide today. Uh, you look at Dulles and Eisenhower and uh, Loy Henderson, who was like, you know, the striped pants dean of the Foreign Service in those days, and ambassador to India. Uh, they described Nehru as internal documents, arrogant, self-righteous, vain, immature, he should become an adult. Uh, Eisenhower, he said, he suffers from a, an inferiority complex and in schizophrenia that's demonstrated by his terrible resentment of domination by whites, which is obviously a form of insanity after India's history. Uh, and he, Eisenhower explained this psychosis, his schizophrenia, he said it was caused by the fact that Britain had treated India as a spoiled child that had been coddling it too much. So, you know, the Indians had these weird attitudes. Uh, and there was some other evidence for his psychic disorders. Uh, Nehru condemned uh, Dutch atrocities in Indonesia. Uh, that showed his lack of stability, uh, Loy Henderson pointed out. Uh, he sought Asia for, he followed an Asia for the Asians creed, Dulles said, another proof of instability. I mean, obviously, the United States would never advocate anything like the Monroe Doctrine, let's say. Uh, the point is that Nehru didn't comprehend that it's supposed to be Asia for Western investors, like the Monroe Doctrine in the real, real world. Uh, another thing that really irritated the hell out of them was that Nehru failed to recognize the necessary purity of American intentions, and he refused to line up 100% uh, behind the uh, holy war that the uh, 
fanatic and hysterical U.S. leadership saw themselves as fighting. Incidentally, those words are quite accurate. Scholarship really has to work overtime to suppress the content of the documents written by people like Nitze and uh, Atchison and so on, because they really sound exactly like raving maniacs. That's why nobody ever quotes them, that they realize that the, uh, <laughs> these are the major documents. Well, you know, this is the kind of guy who you can't really deal with, uh, kind of like Aristide today, or in fact anyone who doesn't understand that uh, the job of the niggers is to shine Whitey's shoes and do it with proper gratitude. That's world order. Uh, well, uh, finally, Europe was kicked out of its imperial domains, leaving tremendous wreckage. Uh, India gained independence. Uh, you know what happened. It sought to return to the course of industrialization and modernization that Britain had blocked. Uh, the United States was in a position to help, but wouldn't, although finally it did. Uh, in fact, it was rather cruel. So, for example, in 1950 and 51, there was a major famine in India. And the United States refused to release its, its uh, excess, uh, you know, had excess agricultural uh, 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 surpluses all over the place. Uh, they finally agreed to release them after the Korean War, although Atchison insisted that India must first uh, show that it understands the depths of the danger we face by joining the anti-communist crusade. Of course, we had no obligation to face, the, understand the depths of the danger India faced, and uh, uh, af well after India requested aid, it was granted a loan, not aid, repayable in strategic materials, uh, now that they understood the depths of the danger we faced. There's one scholarly study of this, a good one, by Dennis Merrill, recent from, based on declassified documents, and he concludes the following. He says, uh, no reliable statistics exist on how many additional famine-related deaths occurred during this period. But it's clear that during 1950 and 1951, as millions of Indians struggled each day to survive on as little as nine ounces of food grains, American policymakers sought to work India's distress to America's advantage in its Cold War policies and search for strategic materials. Well, absolutely nothing changed in later days. If you look at the record, it's very consistent on one thing. I mean, under Eisenhower and Kennedy, there was, a, you know, they did decide they better give some aid to India, but it was always for the same reason. Uh, it's, uh, for, it's because we have to ensure that China doesn't look like a model for the third world. And therefore, we have to support India so it'll look like a model now pretty much within our, uh, uh, under our control. And so it remained. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the experiments, meanwhile, continue. You just heard about the contemporary ones. Uh, the, there's actually a recent publication. Oxford Press just published three years' worth of reports from the uh, Economic and Political Weekly, <coughs> uh, 1990 through 1994, early 94, and they are pretty grim, I should say, it didn't, kind of like what you were talking about. They warn of the, uh, what they call the systematic deterioration of the economy and deindustrialization, along with the growth of luxury consumption. Uh, and all of which looks very similar to the Latin American model. I mean, one of the reasons why Latin America is really never developed as compared with East Asia. Uh, and that's a model that the U.S. has crafted for half a century. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's what uh, liberalization means when it's under foreign control, and it means it internal to the industrial societies themselves at this point. So the United States is being driven towards kind of a third world model, Britain even more so. Uh, the rest of Europe and Japan, the rest of the first world, Europe and Japan, are trying to hold out, but they won't be able to under the globalization of production that's now possible. Uh, and uh, I think what we're now seeing is a kind of a global experiment, sort of like the experiment that the British carried out in Bengal a couple centuries ago. Uh, the global experiment is to see whether it's possible to run a world uh, in which production is done by the most poor and impoverished and oppressed people anywhere, uh, and the production is for the rich. Uh, fairly substantial sectors in the rich societies and very small sectors in the poor societies, uh, with an enormous mass of completely superfluous people, people of the kind you send the death squads after in the third world, and you put in jail in the United States. It's one reason why the contract for America calls for increasing the uh, 
already huge uh, criminalization of the population. The United States long ago passed other countries in uh, throwing its population in jail, and this has almost nothing to do with crime. If you look at it, it has virtually no connection with crime. It's just a war against the kind of people who if in Brazil would be killed by death squads because they're superfluous. They don't contribute to wealth production, and therefore they have no rights. Uh, the drug war, which is almost a total fraud, has been manipulated in order to provide a technique by which the con even minimal constitutional rights of the black population are not are simply totally disregarded uh, because, so that they can be jailed uh, and gotten rid of. That's incidentally another Keynesian stimulus to the economy, which is another reason why Gingrich likes it, uh, along with the Pentagon. In fact, it's about at the scale of the Pentagon. If you look at the crime industry now, the federal subsidies that go into construction and uh, supervision of criminals and lawyers and all that kind of stuff is roughly at the scale of the Pentagon, but it's not as favored as the Pentagon, like Gingrich likes it, but not as much as the Pentagon because it's not skewed so sharply towards the wealthy. Uh, it's more distributed, you know, in terms of the federal largesse and therefore not quite as good. Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, the attempt is to see, it's an experiment, to see if you can construct, a, if you can develop an international society that is basically on the third world model, uh, meaning sector of great wealth and privilege, you know, huge mass of misery, enormous number of just superfluous people who you get rid of somehow. Uh, the uh, meanwhile, exactly as you heard, the central, just not just in India, but on a world scale, uh, decision, effective decision making is moving more and more into the hands of unaccountable uh, centralized institutions, the big transnationals, the kind of quasi-governmental institutions that they're spawning, uh, which are, you don't know what's going on inside them. They have enormous power. Parliamentary systems are declining uh, relative to them. Uh, the new trade agreements are designed to give them even more power. Uh, not only is that an attack on democracy, but it's even an attack on markets, uh, since the economic transactions that take place internal to huge corporations obviously don't operate on market principles. Uh, they operate by a central, central control, and that's not small. It's about 40 percent of what's called world trade is internal to huge transnational, centrally managed transactions. Uh, so all of this is intended as an attack on markets, except for the poor. They're going to suffer market discipline. Uh, an attack on democracy, uh, and uh, a creation of a kind of an international third world model. And nobody knows if it'll work. Uh, nobody knows uh, whether enough resistance will develop uh, to be able to dismantle these structures of violence and domination, uh, uh, resistance which will have to be international in scale, just as the centralization of power is something quite new. Uh, these are just open questions, and they are indeed the large questions for the future, in my opinion. The, uh, with regard to economic liberalization and uh, democracy, there's a kind of conventional view uh, it was given an official form about a year ago by the uh, National Security Advisor, Anthony Lake, uh, when he announced what's called the Clinton Doctrine. Uh, the Clinton Doctrine states that we are now going from containment to enlargement. Uh, during the Cold War era, we contained the threat to market democracies, uh, but now we will uh, proceed to expand their reach. That's the prospects for liberalization democracy, very bright for both of them. Uh, that uh, was, of course, greeted with considerable awe and acclaim. It's standard. It's unchallenged, here at least, uh, so, so much so that it would be superfluous to waste much time with quotations. In my view, it's false in every respect. Uh, I think in the real world, democracy and markets are under quite sustained attack, uh, including the industrial democracies with the most powerful of them, in fact, leading the attack. Uh, as for changes in world order, uh, of, uh, there are some, I don't think, of the ones that Lake is talking about, and some of them are quite important. Uh, but much more important than the, than the changes, in my opinion, are the continuities, which are pretty dramatic. 
and I think they go back for uh, centuries in any respect. Uh, and I think they're not only more striking, but also worth a lot more attention because they carry lessons with them. The continuities arise from institutions. The institutional structures are quite stable, uh, and therefore the tendencies are likely to persist. So I think we should not ignore them. Well, I want to look at a few of these questions. I'll focus a bit on, mainly on South Asia, but I think it's the same everywhere we look. Uh, there is a view of uh, world order which is quite contrary to the one that Anthony Lake described, that this great future for democracy and uh, uh, liberalization. Actually, it was put rather nicely by, uh, of all people, Winston Churchill uh, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, when he described, I think, the way the world works with admirable precision, uh, he was describing the world that was then being planned, or, or at least that he hoped was being planned. Actually, it was being planned a little bit differently than he expected, uh, but he was hoping to be a partner in the planning, not recognizing uh, where England stood with relation to power at that time. Uh, he said that the government of the world must be entrusted to the satisfied nations, if the world government were in the hands of hungry nations, there would always be danger, but none of us have any reason to seek for anything more. The peace will be kept by those, by people who live in their own way and are not ambitious. Our power placed us above the rest. We are like rich men dwelling at peace within their habitations, and therefore we have a right to rule. That's the way the world ought to be and will be, he said. Uh, and that's reasonably accurate, except for his misconception of Britain's role. Uh, Southeast, <laughs> Southeast Asia was uh, much on Winston Churchill's mind at the time. Uh, he was, you know, operation, and it was recognized right off that that would be a way to control civilian populations. Actually, it was pioneered by Woodrow Wilson uh, in his uh, uh, invasion of Haiti, uh, where the Marines, for the first time, I think, ever carried out coordinated uh, uh, military actions against civilian populations using air power, and the Brit British got the idea. They decided that air power should be used to uh, control the populations and maintained that view. Uh, about 10 years later, in the early 30s, during the disarmament, there were a couple of disarmament conferences, uh, England fought very hard to prevent uh, restrictions against the use of aircraft against civilians. Uh, the reason was explained by another British statement, statesman, Lloyd George, uh, after Britain, when he was congratulating Britain on its success in blocking any such conditions, uh, he put it pretty pithily. He said, we have to reserve the right to bomb niggers. Uh, niggers is the word for everyone outside of you know, the white uh, rich people, uh, and <clears throat> in internal documents. So we have to reserve the right to bomb niggers. And therefore, it was necessary to make sure that uh, there be no constraints against the use of aircraft against civilians. Uh, Churchill had his own ideas about this. They actually came up uh, when he was uh, Secretary of State in the War Office around, uh, around 1920. Uh, Britain was having problems holding the empire. Uh, and the uh, Royal Air Force in Cairo uh, sent a request to the government uh, uh, for authorization, as they put it, to use a poison gas uh, against recalcitrant Arabs as experiment. Of course, desperately seeking then to hang on to the empire, including the crown jewel. Uh, he recognized, of course, that this would be a lot harder than it was the last time he had to face this problem during the First World War, when uh, Churchill was colonial secretary and secretary of state in the War Department. And then, too, there was a problem about how to hang on to the empire. Britain had been seriously weakened by the First World War, uh, uh, but it was still in a position. And it recognized they would have to go through early stages of what's now called decolonization. Uh, and that meant both a diplomatic and a military aspect. The diplomatic aspect was outlined during the war by Lord Curzon and the Parliamentary Commission. Uh, they recognized that England was no longer in a position to control the colony, to really rule the colonies directly as in the past. Uh, it would therefore have to set up what they called local facades uh, that would technically govern decolonization uh, 
but that uh, Britain would continue to rule behind uh, what they called constitutional fictions of various sort. Uh, still, the local facades would do the direct management and would give an appearance of independence, which they hoped would facilitate British rule. Of course, there had to be a mailed fist in the background, and that was discussed too. And again, Britain was no longer in a position to rule the whole colonial world by direct military occupation. It was just too weak after the First World War. But new technology was coming along, which they hoped would help, primarily air power. Uh, this was the time when air power was just coming into uh, the recalcitrant Arabs, in that case were uh, mostly Kurds and Afghans. Uh, the India office was a bit uneasy about it. They were having a hard enough time controlling the population anyway, and they thought that poison gas would, even if it was used somewhere else, would arouse all sorts of opposition. Remember, of course, that this is after the First World War. Poison gas was considered, you know, the ultimate atrocity. Uh, Churchill, however, was quite outraged by what he called the squeamishness of those who are unwilling to use poison gas against uncivilized tribesmen, uh, and he he urged that it be done, it would create a lively terror, he said, and would uh, uh, permit the control of uh, the niggers. Well, those are themes that are also persistent. They run right up to the present day, and there are good reasons for them, and we can expect them to continue. Uh, <clears throat> in the mid-1940s, uh, the situation was a bit different. Holding on to the empire was going to be much harder. Uh, because the United States, first of all, Britain didn't have the power, and also the United States really wasn't interested. It wanted, uh, which was, the U.S. was then running the world, and it wanted what's called a liberal international economy, meaning one that it could run, since it had just overwhelming uh, power. And those who know that they are overwhelmingly powerful generally tend to be in favor of a certain kind of liberalization, figuring that they can win in the competition, a certain kind. I'll come back to that. Uh, Churchill was hoping for an American partnership in running the world, uh, but Washington had a rather different view, which was expressed a bit later by Dean Acheson in private discussion. Uh, he said that uh, during the Kennedy administration, he said, Britain uh, is our lieutenant. 